Thank you everyone for joining this important conversation where we're going to be exploring the role of presidential transitions in effective governance and what we can and should learn from this recent uh, Biden transition for the future. This conversation comes at a critical time for our democracy. We are seeing every day how decisions made during the transition are translating into governing during one of the most challenging moments in our history. It's also been against the backdrop of the Senate impeachment trial where senators had been contemplating what is perhaps an existential question for the continuation of our democratic republic, and that is namely how to protect the peaceful transition of power. I'm Christy George. I'm on the board of the Roosevelt Institute and Roosevelt Forward, and I'm so pleased to be joined today by Senator Ted Kaufman and Roosevelt President and CEO Felicia Wong. Recently, the Partnership for Public Service said that future Republican and Democratic transition teams will study the Biden transition for decades to come. Senator Kaufman is the architect of that model. In fact, Senator Kaufman has been involved in four presidential transitions, Obama-Biden, Biden-Harris, and as an advisor to the Partnership for Public Service in 2012 and 2016 as well. As a senator from Delaware, he was deeply involved in Wall Street reform and in highlighting the importance of federal employees. I found his work championing the value and the importance of public service to be hugely inspiring. And he is currently a visiting professor at the Duke University School of Law. Felicia Wong leads the Roosevelt Institute's work to promote a bold political and economic vision that brings the ideals of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt into the 21st century. Trained as a political scientist, uh, Felicia is the co-author of The Hidden Rules of Race, Barriers to an Inclusive Economy, and in her personal capacity, served on the Biden-Harris Transition Advisory Committee. Thank you both so much for joining us. And one housekeeping note before we get started, the chat box is below your video screen, and I encourage all of you to chat your questions. We're going to have uh, plenty of time for discussion, and I promise to get to as many of your questions as I can. So, Senator Kaufman, let's start with you. Yep. When you were a senator in 2009, you wrote a law, the first of two on this very subject, that made important changes to the presidential transition process. Following your time working uh, with the Obama Biden transition team, I'm curious to know what attracted you to this issue as a senator? Well, what attracted me was basically, uh, I've been interested, interested in the transition process in 2008. Uh, I was involved in that when uh, President Obama picked Vice President, first Vice President running mate Joe Biden. Mark Gittenstein and I, uh, who's both long time involved with uh, uh, President, now President Biden, co-chaired the Vice President's transition. And in that position, we also were on the leadership of the uh, President Biden's the total transition. Um, and so we were involved and we were involved from right after the Democratic Convention until November 22nd, when Delaware Governor Ruth Ann Minner asked me to take Senator Biden's seat in the Senate. When I came to the Senate, I decided to change the law to incorporate what I learned in the 2008 Obama trans Biden transition. So that, Christy, that's really how I got into it. And then as a follow-up to that, how did your time working with the Obama-Biden transition inform your thinking about the changes to the transition process that needed to be made? Yeah, well, in 2008, uh, before, the Biden, before, the, before the presidential transition did not start in public until after Election Day. So you, really, you were stuck. That gave the incoming administration only 70 days for the transition. As a result, all presidential campaigns started hidden transitions before election day. Um, when they did this, it was essential that their activities be kept hidden. If they were discovered, the candidate was accused by their opponent of being overconfident, hmm. usually with words like they were measuring the drapes in the White House. Yeah. Not a good look, especially in the last weeks of a campaign. 
to give you some idea of what transitions are about and how difficult they are, talk to your friends in major corporations. Ask them what it'd be like if they had to replace all the top managers in just 70 days, while at the same time, still having to carry on all their manufacturing, marketing, and other services. The largest corporations in the world are relative midgets compared to the United States government the largest and most complex organization in history. As you know, it includes 2.1 million employees, the most powerful military in the history of the world. One bad move can institute a crisis nationally or internationally. In addition, the US government is most vulnerable exposure to national security threats from foreign enemies during its transition of power. That's one of the reasons why the transition is so important. One of the many reasons why the activities leading up to and including the January 6th insurrection were so damaging to our country. Christy, my bill had a number of main elements. It moved up the delivery of GSA services to the nominated candidates from election day to when they were officially nominated at the party convention. The way, the way it worked previous to that was after you won the, the, presence, the, the presidency, then General Services Administration would come in and give you equipment and things like that. We moved, the biggest thing in the bill was we moved it up to after, the, after you received the nomination, you then could get these services, which essentially doubled the amount of time that a successful nominee could spend working on their transition. So think back to my thing, 70 days trying to get a, a major corporation up. Now you'd have essentially 140. It also brought the transition out of the shadows. The fact that GSA was going to start providing these services uh, so early, candidates could start their transitions early without being accused of overconfidence or measuring the drapes in the White House. This was a big deal. You could come right out, right after the convention, everybody knew you were going to get started on your, uh, on your transition as I say, doubling the amount of time that you had in previous transitions. Under the law, GSA provided the nominated candidates with fully equipped office space, communication services, briefings, training, and the start of security clearances for prospective personnel. That was a big deal. The law also allowed the candidates to use funds from campaign money and from separately raised 501c4 funds to supplement services provided by GSA. There were a lot of services that you really, uh, GSA did not cover. They covered the bulk of it and they got us out from behind having to be hidden, but there were other services and we were allowed to use campaign funds were left over and money raised from 501c4 funds to supplement what GSA gave us. We were coming out in 2008 when we came in, the Bush administration led by Josh Bolton had fully cooperated with the Obama transition. To memorize that, my bill authorized appropriations for the incumbent administration to coordinate and plan for the transition. Finally, the law established a transition coordinating council and a transition director's council in the administration, which developed information to aid the incoming administration. This information had to be reported to the Congress three and six months before election day. In 2015, I was working, helping the partnership with public service and I helped work on the Edward Ted Kaufman and Michael Levitt Presidential Transition Improvements Act. It went further than my bill. It expanded my bill, my law, to establish a white hand transition aid and coordinating council and an agency transition director's council six months before the election. It mandated a federal transition coordinator to coordinate transition planning across all agencies of the federal government. It did require each agency to manage internal transition activities and submit reports. I figured when that bill was signed, that'd be the end of my personal involvement in science of presidential translations. Little did I know what was going to come. It's amazing to listen to you and to think about what a monumental management task these transitions oh. are and imagining administrations without the benefit of these changes that you um, that you made. I, I'm curious, 
when you assemble a transition team, what are you looking for? What are the values that you elevated under your leadership? That's a great question, Christy. I mean, it really is right on point. You're right. A normal, we knew right from the beginning that we were going to happen exceedingly difficult. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the most difficult presidential transition in history. When we started organizing the team, the country was facing three historic crises, a once in a hundred years pandemic, a destroyed economy, and a long overdue racial reckoning. But probably the greatest challenge was what President Trump had done to the federal government. The one certainty we all agreed on was that finding and enlisting the best people was our most important priority. Let me repeat that, because this is really key. It's key to everything you do, but it was especially key to this when faced with the incredible problems that we were going to, challenges we were going to have to face. Finding and enlisting the best people was our most important priority. It was in fact, did in fact turn out to be the key to our success. We, you were asked, we were looking for people who had success in managing, the experience to do the job, could pass an extensive public and private vet, were team players, and would constitute a final transition staff that would reflect the face of America. Those are great challenges. That's what we had to get. That's what people had to get in order to get into, our, into, into this transition. We had an incredible advantage in this search, and I really mean this. Our president, President Biden, would be the most experienced president in history. I, I, I'll, I'll talk, go back and look at your list and submit them, but you're going to have find a hard, hard time finding, giving me anybody that has federal experience. No incoming president came close to his 30 years in the Senate and eight years in the vice president. I'm like a little sidelight here. That's one of the things that's wrong in the way we run our campaigns. The way we run our presidential campaigns now is if you have experience, you're just a target. You, you're, you're, you're a target. If you run for president and you don't have any experience, boy, you get up on that stage and you can say anything. So what, we, don't, we don't like people experience anymore. Most of the time now we like governors. Uh, a pre, uh, Senator Obama, Obama was elected as a president, but he'd just been in the Senate for four years. So we had, we had an incredible advantage when we got started on this thing. The, the problems were great, but we had this incredible advantage. As I said, President Biden being most experienced. The most obvious result of that was that he was familiar with the issues we'd face as president. Obviously, you come into presidency, you know the issues, that's really important. And how the federal government works, or at least how the federal government is supposed to work. What in fact turned out to be equally as important what he, he, is that he knew a lot of successful, experienced, and qualified people. Maybe even more important than knowing the people, he knew the people who knew a lot of successful, experienced, qualified people. When we were sitting trying to pick the budget, the, 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 the cabinet, you go through all the different things that, that, uh, that you want in a cabinet person. By the way, they have to be qualified. They have to be confirmable. They have to be experienced. We got to be worried about whether they create vacancies in the House, the Senate, or the judiciary. We have to have vetting results at a public and private vet. We have to have, we want very much, and we had diversity, and we need to create people that have teams, and we got to have interest group balance. So when you're sitting there doing that, you're going to come up with people when, in the room, they're going to say, well, you know, there's Joe Brown. Joe really has a lot of these things. He really looks good, but we, you know, does anybody here know somebody that knows Joe Brown? or Mary Smith. And someone would say, yeah, I know them. I'll go talk to them. And they come back. This is, not, this, this is really the way it happens. They come back and say, you know, they really, they have a lot of wonderful talents. But maybe I talk to people who work with them, a number of people. They're just not good managers. Mm -hmm. And this is a particular cabinet post that's going to require a lot of management capability. Now, sometimes you can fix up management capability by having a, 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 head, a, a, a secretary He's not a strong a manager, and then put in deputies that are really strong in administration. But to give you some idea, the key thing is how do we get to the best people we have? And I think that's the reason why we had such an extraordinary uh, selection of, of, of people for the cabinet, was because we not only knew people, but we knew people that knew people. That's Knowing great, Felicia. I'd love, to have, 
Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. I was just uh, going to invite Felicia to jump in here, given your personal perch on the Transition Advisory Committee. What are the kinds of leadership qualities you saw elevated? And I'd love to hear any examples from your experience of how those values uh, manifested in action or when you saw them prove successful. Um, again, such good questions, Christy. And I wanted to thank both you and Senator Kaufman uh, for joining us here today. I think what you've heard the Senator describe is a process that tried to bring and did actually successfully bring rules and order and process and values to this incredible management challenge at an, at an unbelievably chaotic time in American history, right? So if you think about trying to put together a multi-thousand person entity uh, that is the federal government um, at a time with so much chaos, um, I think the senator is absolutely right that what you need is top-notch people. And let me just add that you need, this is not only a management endeavor, and it's not actually really a business endeavor, it's a political endeavor, right? So what you are also trying to do is to bring people together from across the very big tent that is the Democratic coalition. So you need to bring people, of course, who have known Senator Kaufman and President Biden for many, many years, and at the same time, bring people who have been in other parts of the party, more progressive parts of the party, people who had supported other candidates, obviously Senator Warren, Senator, uh, Senator Sanders. Um, and what is really remarkable is that th this transition, and I saw it from my transition advisory board perch, what's really remarkable is that this transition actually brought together not just cabinet nominees and not just you know assistant secretaries and deputy assistant secretaries, but actually people who worked on the transition itself, who represented every single part of uh, that very broad democratic tent. I, I truly admire the way in which this team saw this as again, a management endeavor, but also a political endeavor. Just a couple of examples. Um, Gautam Raghavan, who was very senior in presidential personnel, uh, both for the transition and now actually at PPO, the Presidential Personnel Office. You know, Gautam comes from, he had worked previously for uh, famously progressive uh, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Representative Pramila Jayapal, right? So you have people like that, and then you have people also who have been uh, sort of long time in the Biden wing of the Democratic Party. And so it was that combination of kinds of people uh, that really made in the context of rules, of course, that really made for, I would say, one of the most incredible and interesting experiences of my professional life, being able to contribute to that and then watch all of that happen. Thank you, Felicia. That's a good segue. I, I, I've seen you um, and know you to have been a real leader in efforts to ensure that a truly diverse set of voices and experiences have the opportunity to really engage in public service. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about why that's actually important and what it means for governing. Right. Well, one of the things that the Roosevelt Institute has long advocated for is this idea that obviously ideas matter, policies matter, but what matters even more is the people who carry those ideas into real life and into fruition. We sort of like to say that who writes the rules matters. Um, and so as part of that effort, once we uh, knew that, or, or were first hopeful that, and then ultimately knew that, uh, there would be a Democrat who might be receptive to this idea that people with Rooseveltian values, Rooseveltian ideas that meet the moment uh, were sort of ready to serve. Um, one of the things we really tried to do was to elevate individuals who uh, could bring those qualities both to the White House uh, and to various cabinet positions. So just for example, I think it is absolutely remarkable that some of the people who are at the Office of Management and Budget, people like, and these are you know, what's interesting is these are like not really headline making roles. These are roles um, that are sort of technocratic and sort of rule making, but are incredibly important. So you see people like Sabil Rahman, who is a young uh, uh, Muslim lawyer, um, and he is now the senior advisor for the 
uh, for OIRA in the Office of Information and Regulatory Administration uh, within OMB. You see people like Sharon Block, who had who was more experienced actually than Sabil. Uh, Sharon had been uh, previously worked for Tom Perez at the Department of Labor. So you see this really diverse group of people, uh, both with both experience and some new mud coming in to try to make. Uh, make the case uh, that now is obviously a Biden moment, a Biden-Harris moment, uh, and also a Rooseveltian moment. Uh, Senator Kaufman, I've been yeah. really encouraged by your emphasis on leadership that is reflective of America, and I wanted to see if you had any comments to add to what Felicia said. Well, it, it, no, this was, this is a, a candidate Biden made it clear right from the beginning that, that diversity was a very important part of what we were doing. And uh, we just started out just saying, we're going to have diversity here. But I want to tell you what, if sometimes, you know, when you get into a decision like this with all the challenges we have coming and the rest of it, there are people who will say, well, you know, we got to let that go because we really got to get the very best people, you know, implying that there's going to be some lack of people and if you get people who are diverse. I'll tell you what, I, we have the transition and the presence, uh, the presidency is incredibly diverse, and uh, we have incredible quality of people. I mean, the people on our on that transition knocked my eyes out. I can remember one of them came in to me, someone who who, who I, is has a major position in the administration and it's going to get even bigger, and and uh, I said to her, you know, if I come back in second life, I want to have your career. I mean. She was so incredibly qualified, so many incredibly qualified people uh, of all, all parts of diversity. No, no, it was, it, was, it was easy, it was exciting, it was something that, that worked out. Again, take, just take a look at who was on the transition and take a look at who's in the administration and you say, wow, the first thing you don't say is, wow, that's a picture of America. Now, if we make a photograph, you'll say that's a picture of America. But if you just ask somebody, they, they just say basically what Felicia was very kind to say and what other people have said, this is just a great transition. Yeah. Really qualified people. So this, this, hopefully one of the side products of this will get, get rid of this idea that, that somehow if you're going to have diversity, you're going to be sacrificing quality. I just don't believe it. Christy, can I add something to that, though? Because I think it's important to say that to do this kind of hiring, to hire multiple thousands of people, 70 days was too little, 140 days is too little to do this kind of hiring. And what it really takes is work, right? It oh. takes the kind of hard, anyone who's ever hired somebody knows that what you need to have is a great list. You need to do a tremendous amount of sourcing. You need to talk to a lot of people about that person, about these multiple hundreds of people. In fact, in this case, it was multiple thousands of people. And so one of the things I'm really proud that we've done at the Roosevelt Institute is always, again, prioritize people. We are always 24-7, 365, talking to people about not only their ideas, but the kinds of service that they might want to uh, hold. And we do build lists of people who might ultimately want to serve in federal government. Um, and it is just an incredibly, it, it is really time consuming. I don't think we do it enough uh, in politics or in the progressive movement. And if you do that kind of work all the time, that means that then when a job comes up, you're not just calling your friend. By the way, maybe your friend would be great at that job. But there are probably scores of other people who also might be great at that job who you don't know. So you have to keep asking and keep sourcing to get the kind of diversity and quality that the Senator referenced. I continue to be so impressed in listening to you both about the sheer scale of that management task that was in, in front of uh, both of you. Um, Senator Kaufman, you alluded to this earlier, but this transition has happened in a context of impossible circumstances. And yet as a transition, it's been remarkably successful. To what do you attribute that success? Well, uh, I think first, as I stated earlier, the most important reason for this transition success was having an experienced president presidential candidate and that and Joe Biden. He understood and helped in all parts of the transition. When I mean understood and helped, I mean in all parts of the transition. Second was we made a very early start in the transition, much earlier than any transition I've ever seen or heard of. Back in February, 
of last year, almost a year before the election, Mark Gittenstein and I sat down with David Marshak and Dan Hyman from the Partnership for Public Service in my home in Wilmington and start a discussion on the possible transition. That was months before I won. And so we did it. We let, let the uh, presidential candidate know what we were doing. We worked for about two months. And then on April 22nd, a, a new record, I'm sure, presidential candidate Joe Biden asked me to begin finding people for the transition. April, if you can believe that. Within a week, we'd signed up Jeff Science and Johannes Abraham. If you know either one of them, you know what they can do. They, they, I mean, Johannes, I had so many people when, it, when, when the word guy said, you know that Johannes, he's really good. And of course, Jeff Science right now is doing an incredible job and on COVID. He could not have a better person than Jeff Science dealing with, with what is the single most important thing that, we're, that the administration is dealing with. Now, a good part of the first months, we spent defining the challenges that the transition would face. The conventional challenges, we have, you have conventional challenges and you have unconventional challenges. The conventional challenges are the ones that you have every four years. Let me tell you something, being involved in four transitions, every four years, it gets a lot harder. So the conventional challenges are not easy, but this time they were greatly overshadowed by the unconventional challenges that I mentioned earlier caused by the COVID. I don't bring it up again, but it's so, such an important part. COVID-19, the economy, the racial reckoning, and President Trump. We found many new challenges. I went back in my files for this for the call, and I went back to an early memo. I think it was like in April, OK? And, and just to give you an idea, here's what the unconventional challenges we talked about in April. Election returns uncertain or delayed. Hmm. That was pretty good, right? <laughs> COVID-19 gains traction and limits voting. The recession turns into a depression. Increase in the level and intensity of social protests and government response. Extraordinary US debt levels constrain fiscal space for bold Biden initiatives. Listen to this one. Increased hardening of political divides, tribalism, and hyperpartisanship. Trump blocks. Trump blocks, this is like in April, okay? Trump blocks Biden transition, claiming he won and utilized a well funded highly orchestrated campaign against us. Isn't that amazing? We were forced into it. And, and then, and this, again, this is April. We, the thing wasn't really, the pandemic was up and it was a problem. But we, we'd be forced into a virtual transition, raising operational and security measures. That, that's the key. I mean, when, and, and anybody that's been involved in problem solving, decision making knows, figuring out what it is, the, 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 the atmosphere that you're going to be in when you're doing this is absolutely important. Second thing was, we had four rules for the trans transition that turned out to be valuable. The first and more important, I'll spend a couple minutes on it, but, but it is the transition will do no harm to the campaign. One of the things I've learned in politics is when you got a transition, you got a campaign, the campaign people has all the leadership in it, the candidate, the campaign manager, and those folks, they don't spend any time on the transition. We gave briefings and things like that. The transition, they come in and the transition has been working for even back in the old days, two, four months. This one had been working for like six months, seven months. And they say, well, wait a minute, I, explain this all to me like in a week or a month. And you sit there and you try to explain it to them. Look at what happened to the Trump transition. Remember Chris Christie and that whole transition? They had some good people working on that. Uh, some of the people from uh, Michael Levitt, who worked on the Romney transition, is really a smart guy. And boy, Trump people came in. Of course, they were the Trump people. But they came in and just throw the whole thing out. So one of the important things for us is, is, is we got to make sure we do no harm to the campaign. We're not out there raising money in competition with the campaign. We got to blend in and we got to figure out how they're going to go together. Second thing was the old Las Vegas thing. What happens in the transition stays in the transition. If you're watching this, you know that in Washington and around the country, who's going to get the jobs and who's going to get the policy in the transition is like, it's like, well, it, it, it's like overpowering. So you've got to make, be very sure that you don't mess everything up by getting stuff that the transition is working on at a very preliminary level and have it get out there that that's like the campaign is uh, doing. 
the, fi the thing that was confusing to a lot of people was the candidate and the campaign make policy, not the transition. One of the things we learned in Senator Biden, I don't know, eight, you know, 10 campaigns ago, was that if you want to get something done when you get elected, you better talk about it in campaign. People think that you talk about in campaign issues in order to get votes. That's part of it. Their promise is broken. But if you want to get something done in a campaign, you better talk about in, 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 a, in, a, in an administration. You better talk about in a campaign. So what we did all the years that I worked for him, but especially this time, he kept a book. And then it was everything he said and promised it in the campaign. In fact, if you go back and look at Joe Biden's campaign, he would give speeches to prepare people not for Election Day, but for what was going to happen down the road. Build back better. That whole speech, it was important for the election, but it's really important it's over. Because if after you win a campaign, you come in and somebody says, well, I don't like that. Well, that doesn't matter whether you like it or not. That's what the people voted me in to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And finally, we go back to the one point that we keep coming up with. The transition will reflect the face of America. Thank you so much for that. Felicia, I'd love to get one uh, more question in for you, and then let's move to the Q&A. I'm curious about this role of an effective transition in ensuring a peaceful transition of power, and then also kind of how your experience on the um, advisory committee has changed the way you think about governance, so moving from transition into governing. Hmm, it's a good question. Well, I mean, this is probably pretty obvious, but I will say that one of the things I think we have all learned, and certainly I learned watching all of the transition staff and volunteers work, is just that we shouldn't take a peaceful transition of power for granted, right? It is really, really, really hard. We live in a world that is always partisan. Um, it has become hyper-partisan in ways that are frankly dangerous to our democracy and our republic. And the idea that you would have a transition from one leader to another is actually something that I don't think any of us anymore uh, can, as I said, can, can you know take for granted. And so one of the things I think is so important in the kind of rules-based, orderly, uh, process-oriented, but still very political, you know, setup that is a presidential transition is you actually have to, you know, cross your T's, dot your I's, make sure that you do your homework as the senator and his colleagues did in trying to put together this massive entity. Now that isn't going to guarantee a peaceful transition of power, of course, but certainly without it, you are not going to have all the kinds of handovers on national security, on you know, on labor issues, on justice issues that you absolutely need to keep the United States functioning. So I think it's important to think about a peaceful transition of power, but also a transition of power that is functional given the politics that we uh, that we live in. And so, you know, one of the things really to answer the last part of your question, Christy. I really just learned how hard people work on this stuff. It is just incredible, you know. Some of the people on the transition I got to know over the course of it, others of, of them were my friends and colleagues in advance. And man, I would get calls at midnight at 6 a.m. And I was like a volunteer, right? Um, and people, you know, wanted to know what I thought about a new whole of government approach to uh, you know, racial justice and racial inclusion. And, you know, at 5.45 in the morning, they would want to go over, okay, we've got four parts to this. We want to think about the federal government as a model employer. And we'd want to talk about using better data for racial inclusion. And we want to make sure that any new policies actually see money going out to the communities who really need it. And Felicia, what do you think about all of this at, you know, nine at night or again, five in the morning? And what that really tells you is that you know, these are people who are very, very, very dedicated to their own ideas, but actually to their country. And it, I, I was kind of floored by all of that, to be honest with you. It's really moving, this sort of combination of competence and uh, dedication to country. I love hearing that. Um, I'm going to move to some of the questions in the chat. Um, and Felicia, your comments are a good segue uh, to a question for the senator. 
Uh, Senator Kaufman, do you think that future transitions should account for the possibility that the sitting president isn't committed to a peaceful transfer of power? And how did you account for this possibility during the recent transition? Well, we plan for it. I mean, we plan the best you can. You know, there's, you know, there's, uh, but I, I look, I think one of the things I think someone's going to ask, you know, what did you learn from this transition and what would you do if you were back in the Senate? And, and there are some things that we can talk about that if people want to, but I'd like to make one really gigantic point. The, 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 the difficult things in government that I find, or in business, are the unintended consequences of how you act. I think one of the things this has put, I used to tell my students all the time, look, you can talk about all the laws you want to. You can talk about a balance of budget constitutional amendment, but people, people in the administration, in the legislature, they're the ones that are going to work their way around it some, if they, some way or the other. Not to say that's always, we shouldn't have good rules and the rest of that, but, but uh, the people you elect are really, really, really important. And the laws and the Constitution, I never used to include the Constitution. I used to say the laws. But I think after this presidency, you can see that, 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 that he, they just went totally off the rails in terms of what's the law, what was going on, what was the constitutional intent, any of those kinds of things, tradition, other things that, 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 that uh, uh, we use. So I just, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Trump is hopefully once in a 250 years event. I think when we make up the new rules for the transition, we have gotta be very careful about putting in unintended consequences to plan for Trump and then have a real president of the United States uh, be constricted in what they can do and what they have to do and what their abilities are. And if you had to write the next set of changes to the law of presidential transitions, what would you want to see changed? Well, I think the one thing we definitely have to change is this whole issue of ascertainment. The ascertainment is kind of a, a $50 word. And what it, what it means is the way the, the way the, remember I told you about all the, uh, things that they got general services administration uh, provided to the candidates. Well, before they can do that, in the law, it says, you have to ascertain who's a real candidate. So what we had this time was, we had the head of general services administration, a very dedicated woman, and everything I heard was, was great about her and the way she did things. But we put her in a possible situation because she was the one who had to ascertain that Joe Biden had won. She was under incredible pressure from the White House and from the President of the United States not to ascertain that Joe Biden had won. So we've got to come up with a new system of how we determine when the candidate to the, the when a, 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 big, a big, when a candidate wins and then are become eligible. It shouldn't just be on when they become eligible to GSA. It's a much bigger decision than should be left in the hands of the head of the GSA. Is there, you preempted this, um, it did come in uh, through the chat. Um, is there uh, something that you would have done differently? What would it be? You know, I, 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 I've been doing, you know, I've been on the search for a long time and so I'm always very hesitant. Uh, this may be one of the first times in my life that said, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't know how this could have gone better. <laughs> I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's the best or anything. But in terms of, I have all this experience, I wrote the law, all the rest of that stuff, and I had incredible quality people. Um, as I said, many people in the administration, I've never seen, this is like an all-star team uh, of people that were involved in the transition. So I don't know, maybe start even earlier. I, I, I think you can't start too early uh, for these kind of things. Uh, but I, I, I'd be hard pressed. But one of the things, Christy, is, you got to really wait. I, I, I'll probably be able to give you a really good answer like six or eight months from now. All right, I'll hold you to that. Okay. Um, Happy to do it. One of the uh, questions that I had, maybe this is sort of both for uh, Senator Kaufman and Felicia, is how much the regional diversity of potential appointees matters in addition to the racial oh. and ethnic diversity? You please, you want to take that one? No, no, Senator, go ahead. I have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have to have. Uh, and we did. 
I mean, you know, I, I tell you, I won't tell the area, but there was an area when we were first getting started, people say, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, having diversity and, and all come, a lot of it comes involved with experience. You know, you want people with experience. Well, you know, it's hard to be secretary of, of a, a major agency in the federal government if you've had a similar position in a very small state. So there's going to be a national gravitas and if a major managing plan, you're going to want to pick somebody from a big state because they had a big management challenge. You see what I mean? So I think, I think you want diversity, clearly you want uh, national diversity uh, in, in your selections. And that was an important factor in, in our decision. Not part, it really, what, frankly, good question, Chris, you ever asked it. It wasn't part of our diversity discussion, but when, now that I look back on the, on the, on the, Dozens of meetings we had on, on personnel, budget personnel, I mean, uh, 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 people for the uh, cabinet and, and under cabinet positions, especially, uh, we constantly came back to uh, wanting people from uh, different areas and different experience, different size states, different uh, challenges in the states. Clearly, you know, Deb Hollins is, is, is the Secretary of the Interior. Clearly, the, the Southwest has a leg up in terms of when you're looking around to pick somebody to, uh, to be Secretary of Interior. So it, uh, there are certain states that have certain advantages in certain areas, but in the end, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I'd, I'd have to put it in that uh, a picture of America kind of thing. Um, Christy, can I just add to that? Because, you know, of course, from where the Senator uh, is sitting, most of what, most of the kinds of people um, who would rise to the level of, you know, coming to the attention of the chairs, the co-chairs of the transition, are in fact cabinet level. But one of the other things I really want to point out is that you have to hire thousands and thousands of people at the staff level, right? These are not principals, these are not ministerial posts, but these are people, whether they're, you know, economists or statisticians or deputy chiefs of staff, right? People who are doubtless earlier in their career than most cabinet secretaries, but who um, we really need a pipeline for these kinds of people, right? The National Economic Council, just to take one example, is uh, a part of the White House that I think is really important and that we at Roosevelt pay a lot of attention to. You know, you've got like 35 or 40 people who are part of the National Economic Council. Well, where are you going to find all of those people? And can you find people who are diverse, obviously by race and by gender, but also by region and geography? And I think that in order to do that, you really, again, have to do all of your homework and really look. Um, you can look in state governments. You can look, uh, obviously, people who have served uh, in legislative positions um, from around the country. So I think it's really important, and you can get a lot of geographic diversity and many other kinds of diversity, including age diversity, when you're looking at the staff level. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people who are currently, you know, uh, on the staff of the NSC or the NEC or the DPC, one day they're going to be running the place. Um, I sure hope so, anyway. Christy, can I just, uh, yes. uh, Felicia jogged an area that really, I think, may have been our greatest accomplishment. And that was uh, working in transitions for years. Uh, most of the emphasis in transitions are put on the, on the big jobs. Exactly what Felicia, the cabinet secretaries, they're high prestige and the rest of that. The irony is that the Partnership for Public Service that keeps all these statistics, I'd learned over the last four transitions, less and less people were being confirmed in a longer and longer time. Hmm. But people were still pouring all their money into finding the conferral positions. So what we decided to do was say, okay, we're gonna spend as much money and effort on the conferral positions, the important ones, but we're gonna spend an equal amount of money on the non conferral positions. The way the thing works is the, 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 the president has 4,000 people to pick. 1,300 are confirmable, 2,700 are not confirmable. So we're working with the 1,300 that were confirmable, but we went after the 2,700. And let me tell you what, what first off, we didn't slack on the confirmable because we had uh, more people ready to, to be confirmed than any other president in history. But where we really hit a home run was in the people that Felicia was talking about, the non-confirmable. You know, we did, we had 1,100 people ready to go. That's like 8,000 interviews. That's like to find 1,100 people ready to go in the Biden administration on inauguration day. 
That is more people than the Trump administration and Obama administration combined had ready to start 100 days after inauguration. So what, the president, what President Biden had was he, could, he had literally one quarter of all the people that he could hire in his administration ready to go on inauguration day. And, and Felicia, let me tell you, these were the 5.30 in the morning till 2 o'clock at night, Kang. It, it, you can't, watching it happen, I was, you know, I'm I, 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 business school, I taught in business school, I organization, I've done organization. I, I sit there dumbfounded. How are you going to do this? How are you going to interview, have 8,000 people? pick 8,000 people and interview them and go through them and come out with 1,000 people by inauguration day. But they did it. That's so amazing. I keep thinking this would make an amazing business school case study. Yes, it would. Um, I think my sense is the audience, a uh, number of people in the audience are struck by how much forethought went into the question of personnel. How much more is there still to do? And is there any area that's particularly challenging? You mean beyond personnel? Felicia, why don't you take that? Well, I, first of all, I, there are many, many, many jobs, of course, that remain still unfilled. Many important right. jobs, um, you know, certainly many important jobs that reflect some of the things, Senator, that you have cared most about in, term, in your career, sort of regulation of the financial sector. Many of those jobs have yet to be fully filled, um, or many of those departments, even uh, some questions around corporate accountability. Um, it is notable to me, at any rate, that uh, many of the positions that were focused totally understandably on both healthcare, COVID, and uh, economic recovery, those positions were filled, but yeah. some of the longer term regulatory positions, I mean, it has only been, what, 30 days, not even 30 yeah, days. Right. right. And, and anyway, there's still a lot of people to hire. So that that is, um, I think, really important. You know, when you think about policy, I, I just want to say one thing um, about policy, because we spent a lot of time here talking about people. That's what people, that's what, you know, the media always loves to talk about who's going to get what job. But actually, there's a whole other part of the transition that's focused on policy, right? Absolutely. Not on making policy, because as you said, Senator, right. um, it's not the job of the transition to make policy. Those outlines were actually sort of amazingly set out by candidate Biden in the Build Back Better, you know, kind of four pillar program. But it is still the job of the transition policy team to take all that stuff from the campaign trail and to make it into actionable, you know, budgetable uh, sets of choices for an administration once that administration actually has power. And I think that it is, it's, um, that is work that began and that is of course and we've seen it in what some of the first package the 1.9 trillion dollar proposed american rescue package and i think we're going to see a lot of that work still to come then in what i hope will be a recovery package not just a rescue package but a recovery package that um, is able to make good on um all of those other pillars of build back better that focus on investing public money in uh, in decarbonizing industries, investing public money in revitalizing our care industry and our care sector, um, human care, child care, elder care. These are really important things that candidate Biden promised uh, that the transition teams worked on making real. And uh, now it's time to put all those things into practice uh, legislatively and with respect to executive action. So there, there's still a lot of transition work to be both done. I mean, transition work to be followed up on, I suppose. Yeah, I, one of the promises I made to then, I got to keep all of these things out. Campaign, campaign uh, presidential candidate Biden back in, in April was that, that we were going to make sure that when the agency review teams in which Felicia, you were so helpful with, when they went into the agency, they were, they were armed with what is the Biden policy for that agency. That was a very important part. So you're right, the, the transition was very, there are two things we were involved in, people and, and policy. We, but we didn't make the policy, but we took that book and we sliced it and diced it. So that we made sure that everybody went into every agency, knew what the Biden policy was. And, and, and the other thing was in the, in the personnel selection, 
we were very careful that we wanted to put people who were never uh, who supported uh, President Biden's policies. That I mean, that's an important part of of, of selecting people is making sure that they understand that the policy comes out of the president's mouth and uh, we're not interested in incredible innovations in policy by individuals. You implement it, come up with good ideas, send them back to the president, that, all that back and forth. But we wanted people that had started out believing that, that agreeing with and supporting uh, the president's policies. A good segue to this next question, which is that uh, President Biden has said he wants to be the modern FDR. How did that translate into the transition process? Well, that's it. you want me to start? Just to yeah, start? please. I, I would love to hear it from where you sit. Yeah. Um, well, he's. I think he stands in, in awe of President Roosevelt. And I think well, I stand in awe of President Roosevelt. President Roosevelt was faced with incredible, incredible, incredible problems. I think I'd, I'd take ours and kind of put them up against it in terms of, the, you know, what the difficulty was. But he was he he was incredibly marshal the country, which is what uh, President Biden is going to do, marshal the country to take it in a new direction, very different from where it's been in the past, and, and, the, and especially in the recent past. And most of the things that drive it is the middle class. A lot of the things that that FDR uh, uh, was concerned about, average people in their lives, uh, trying to get some kind of financial democracy in this country to get back to, again, a big FDR uh, 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 program with the income inequality. I think everyone agrees that the income inequality here is, and the wealth inequality here is totally out of control. So I think those are common themes in FDR. And I think his style is, 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 is a lot like, uh, like FDR's. Um, the thing that I would add as the president of the Roosevelt Institute, right. the Franklin Roosevelt Institute, um, and the thing that I most admire about what President Biden has put forward is um, FDR was all about government being of the people be, and government helping people very directly. And that is absolutely something that I have heard from President Biden. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about what President Roosevelt did in the 1930s, he directly created jobs for the American people when the unemployment rate was 25%. You know, he, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the WPA, my personal favorite is the uh, Federal Theater Project and the Federal Musicians Project. I mean, he recognized that there were people who had skills, whether it was young men mostly men, who should go and plant trees in the Dust Bowl, or musicians, or architects, or artists, or theater who are out of work. And there is no reason that the government should not do that directly. President Roosevelt understood that. And you hear a lot of that in what President Biden says when he talks about, you know, a way to invest public money, federal money, <laughs> in decarbonizing industries to fight climate change, because then you'll have people who can do, whether it's building retrofitting or solar panel installation, or President Biden talks about bringing more money um, to w mostly women, mostly black and brown women who are care workers, who care for our sick and our elderly. So these are, these are things where I hear very direct um, reflections of what President Roosevelt and actually what Eleanor Roosevelt, who was, let's be honest, better than FDR on race and gender and civil rights. Everyone's got their strengths. Those were hers. <laughs> At any rate, you know, I, I hear a lot of that in what the direct government, direct public service, public power uh, emphases in what uh, the Biden administration has put forward. And I think that is very, very Rooseveltian. Not just the scale of the problem, but the types of solutions. Um, you know, from where I, I'm here to try to help make that happen from where I sit. I could not agree more. We've gotten a number of comments, um, like I'm going to read this uh, out loud, a simple comment. Senator Kaufman, our country was and is so fortunate 
to have you at the helm of the, trans of the transition. We are grateful for your service. Uh, you have had a remarkable career. Can you tell us what you're most proud of? Um, I think uh, I think the transition piece uh, is important part. I think taking the fight to to Wall Street and it working for financial bar was not successful. Sherry Brown and I had a bill that would have greatly advanced that at the time. Um, so I was. Um, uh, I was very, I was very proud of that. And, but the, I think I've got to say the thing I'm proudest of is being helpful to President Joe Biden for almost 50 years. I kind of, in terms of, in terms of vocational things, I kind of blots out the sun in terms of, I'm proudest of my grandkids and, and the great grandchild we're getting in March. Well, that's a great answer. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to make sure people take away from their understanding of the transition and the transition process. No, I think I think with Felicia's help, I, I, I think I think you you covered like a um, PhD thesis on in what is presidential transition about. Again, this is presidential transitions are are incredibly important um, and uh, can always be used more work. But I think you you probably covered it. Very well, Christine, your questions and the questions from the audience. Can I just add one thing, Christy? Um, it's a bit about Senator Kaufman's service and style, and actually a bit about both the transition and the early days of this administration. You know, it's really striking, um, given everything we've seen in the last four years, but really everything we've seen in the past several decades. It's really striking how little drama all told, given all the potential for scandal and backbiting, you know, how little of that we have seen, you know, there have been very few leaks uh, and probably plenty of people, including perhaps some reporters on this call looking for leaks, but there, there's been rel there's been very little. And any of us who work in institutions know that you really can't do good work um, if colleagues don't trust each other, you know, if there isn't a sense of uh, common purpose, you know, shared mission, and really a sense uh, that the endeavor is one in which we're all in it together, you know, without people trying to, I don't know, run to Politico, no, if there's anybody on Politi from Politico here, no offense, Politico, but you know, it's like, it, the truth is people have a job to do, right? And I think what is so incredible about the way in which this whole transition, both the campaign and then the transition and then the early stages of this administration have played out is that really you have seen a kind of service that makes me patriotic, um, true patriotism, I hope, because, you know, people they're kind of not in it for themselves, mostly I'm sure some people are, but really they're in it to try to get a job done. And that is why I think you've seen so little drama and so much so far, you know, so much actual good ideas and good people. That's currently what's making headlines. Felicia, I must tell you, one of the major objectives of the people involved was to get people that were really interested in public service and making the world a better place and people who are not in it for themselves. Because historically, there's been a lot of people in transitions who were involved for particular gain for themselves. And I think this transition went out of its way at all levels to kind of smoke out people like that and go with the people that really believe in public service. And the reason is because the leadership, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about all the leaders, that's why they were in it. That's why they were working, getting up at 5.30 in the morning to do, it, to do, to do uh, meetings to talk about what was going on. Well, that is certainly my, one of my takeaways from this conversation is just how dedicated, competent, um, trusting, and uh, really hardworking the people that have been uh, working on this transition have been. And I thank you both for your service and uh, for joining us in this conversation. And thanks so much to the audience as well. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Christine. Thank, thank you, the audience as well. Senator. Thank you.